without any further ado, from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Jeffrey Coombs! Uh oh! All right, y'all, keep that energy going. We have the Colonel herself. That's right, Bajor for Bajorans, Nana Visitor. And a longtime friend of mine for over 25 plus years or so, you know him as Wolf Michael Dorn. All right, you guys can have a hey, Kennedy. You want you? <laughs> Always, the ladies are first. Holy cats, don't stop clapping just because they've sat down, ladies and gentlemen. Make some noise. <laughs> Welcome to Philadelphia. Thanks for coming out. Thanks so much. This is incredible. Guys, I'm sitting next to Michael Doran. Holy cats. I'm sorry. I can't take it. You can do whatever you like, dear. Oh, you don't have a hat on. <laughs> All right, so, so tell us about your, your con experience so far. What's been your most memorable moment at the great Philadelphia Comic Con? It's not a moment, it's the whole atmosphere. This has been so chill and everybody's been so cool. It's, it's been like a breath of fresh air. This is one of the smoothest, nicest cons I've been to in a while. And it's got to do with you guys. It's really wonderful. Awesome. Now, all of you have done 20 odd years worth of conventioning. Um, what, what, what do you see different, or has anything changed uh, during that 20 year span in terms of conventions? Uh -huh. For yourselves personally? Uh, you know, for me, everybody's, it, it, there, there was a certain hysteria at the beginning that made me nervous. I was just telling um, my friend Monique that w she said, what, what, were the, what was the moment that made you nervous, that you ever got nervous at a convention? And it was one of the first conventions I went to. I went to the, the public restroom, and some woman, when I was in the stall, put her camera underneath. And, and I was like, oh, oh, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. <laughs> I hope you peed on her camera. Did you pee on her camera? I, I did not pee on the camera. I would have peed on her camera. <laughs> that, that, but, that was me. <laughs> I, I wanted to say I did that, but yeah, it was Jeffrey. I put him up to it. But, you know, since then, it's been such a comfortable relationship with, with people who come and people who sign and, and show up. It's, it's, I love it. It's, it's, uh, it's a great atmosphere. Yeah, how about you, Michael? What, what did you, uh, in your years of conventioneering, uh, have you found interesting, consistent, um, different? I, I, the only thing that, that's happened recently um, I mean, the convention thing was always kind of, we did a bunch and it was always kind of a blur. Uh, but the last few years, um, I've met people who were children when we started, in, uh, you know, babies in their parents' arms who are now bringing their kids, babes in arms. To us, and that was um, that was ex interesting and a little disconcerting at times. Yeah. A little thing like you know, I mean, this. I remember in San Francisco there was this kid I was holding like this, and now he's he's like six six five, and he's like, um, yeah, I remember you. And I'm like, so that that's. That has been really interesting. It's not bad. It's just really interesting that that the generations are are continuing. You got to be very proud over that now because you guys are carrying on through the generations. They still want to see you. They still love you, and and the effect that you've had on their lives. Well, I think it's actually a little better now because because we were one of the first serialized shows. Uh, it, it it was difficult if you missed an episode to catch up to know what was going on, and now that it it's on Netflix and you can binge watch, it makes so much more sense. It's just the way we were really meant to be watched. So there's so many new fans and people who saw the show at first that went, I don't know, now they're in. 
I, I, I hear that a lot. Well, it was harder in those days because it was a week in between episodes and you would like, what happened last week? Uh, uh, so that's all gone now, that, that, that gap. And it was visionary, I think, for Iris Stephen Bear to insist on chapters in a long saga, which is now th the way it's accepted. But in those days, it was all about syndication, standalone episodes, you can shuffle them like cards, deal them out any way, it doesn't matter. In reruns, it just doesn't matter, they don't, the stations don't have to think about it. Now, uh, and now with Netflix and streaming, you've, you've got chapters in a long novel. It's a much more preferable... Uh, so, speaking of binge watching, I've been doing my research, because <laughs> I'm that nerd. And uh, I've been going back through early Deep Space Nine in particular, just to familiarize myself with this crew and how it developed. And holy cats, Nana. I don't know if y'all have ever really taken the time to sit there and watch how many times they piss Kira off over the course of the first three seasons alone. Every 20 minutes, it was like, dang, someone... <laughs> Someone come get Kira, please, because she's hot. Was that something that you brought to the character? Was it something that was more written, or did it develop as it go? Like, I, I, I'm just wondering, like, what's going on with that? Well, in the Bible that I received, it did say that Bajoran women, in particular, were incredibly aggressive. So, and I had this friend uh, in school that <laughs> she was, she was, uh, really hot-blooded and even in second grade if someone said something to piss her off a teacher whoever all you'd see is the swinging door she'd be gone she'd be up and out and uh and i very much took that uh part of my character from her yeah. that hot hot blood yeah so speaking of character work i'm stepping on your toes uncle spicy have a seat i know it's been a long day <laughs> jeffrey 13 different characters over the course of your work. Wow. What? <laughs> what do you mean? Wait, 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 wait. I gotta figure this out. Thir Where'd you get 13? Oh, I'm, I'm wrong. 13 episodes with different characters. Apologies. I'm sorry, okay. sir. Okay. You've done so much. I, Cause I'm thinking like Frighteners, I'm thinking old sci-fi work. So everything I've seen you in has started to kind of like blur together because it's all been such great work. But I want to talk about your decisions uh, character-wise with okay. people like Wei Yun, right? With people like, um, and, and just really setting the standard for what the Vorta are. I mean, Brunt, I watched a couple good Ferengi episodes the other night and I was just like, oh, look at Brunt. I hate this dude so much, but I love him. Speaking of Brunt, I got to tell you, something incredible happened to me just now before I came out here. I was talking with a gentleman. John, are you here? There's John. Hi, John. He looks down at my Brunt picture on my table and he goes, we have that costume. I said, what? He said, yeah. My wife and I went to the, the Christie's auction and we have that costume. Wow. I never knew where it went and, I, and it, I now know where it's at. I want it back. No. I, I, and I now know where it lives, and uh, that it's not somewhere collecting dust. lost. So, so tell us about your character work with Wei Yun, because I know that was one of the ones that you had a little bit more creative input with. Wei Yun. You know, there's a lot of uh, flying by the seat of your pants on this stuff, especially when you're a guest star. Um, I was standing on set, and Iris Stephen Bear, the executive producer, came up to me and said, was, I'm in my brunt outfit, and he said, we really like what you're doing, and, but we want to bring you back as a character where we see your face. i never forget that. So I said, that's great, but I thought, bullshit. That's not gonna, uh, come on. Oh, three weeks later, uh, this role of, uh, of a Vorta Weiyun comes up. Now, I have to tell you, uh, I don't know Vorta from New York. I don't know what they are. And I have a call of, uh, I've got a script, but that's all I've got. And I've got a f four o'clock AM call, and I'm taken to a trailer, and uh, this process begins on me, and I have no idea what I'm going to look like. I don't. Wow. But they don't tell you. They don't, they don't run you through a uh, prep. Right. 
you're just slammed into it. And uh, I did have a costume fitting, so I kind of knew what that was all about. And so it's the strangest and frightening thing is that you get into this process, put the contact lenses in, you're in your trailer, you're looking in the mirror, and you're making fast and furious decisions I bet. out of instinct because rehearsal is in five minutes. So it's kind so, so of... So in five minutes, you came up with one of the most devious characters in all of science fiction villainy. Cool, 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 cool. So you just have to hit the ground and trust your instincts, really. Uh, just make strong, valid choices and, uh, and commit. Uh, that's all I can say. Awesome. Okay, hey, let's get these people off their feet. You've you actually got a chair. You have a question. How are you? Hi. Um, first off, I'd like to thank you. Can you can angle that up for you. There first you off, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for coming to Philadelphia. I have uh, been with you for 25 years, ever since she was a baby. That's my daughter. That's and my mom. <laughs> also, here's a question. Can you guys remember your auditions for these individual parts? And then I uh, loved you in the Frasier episode, OK? Oh. All right, you can take it from there, Kennedy. What? Very proud of her. Uh, yeah, I, I do remember that uh, audition very, very clearly. And someone just recently sent me the list of actresses who were up for my role, and it's impressive. I'm glad I didn't look at that list before I auditioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I went and I got a pair of Doc Mar Martin boots <laughs> and a, a khaki green shift of an ugly dress and I, uh, exactly what you said. I just went with my instincts. I felt I knew this woman and I went. And, uh, and evidently they, uh, you know what? The director teaches a class and he just recently told me, David Carson, he directed oh. our, our pilot. He told me that he used my audition in classes Wow. to show uh, what people are looking, that you have to go for it. Uh, and I certainly did. How many, how many auditions did you have? How many times did you come in? Uh, tw two auditions. Oh, wow. Yeah. How, how many did you have, Michael? Just the one? Uh, two. Oh, okay. but, but, the, but a lot of people had multiple. Yeah, the original, uh, not the original, but uh, Next Generation, they had like a month and a half, oh, wow. something or two months of coming back like seven and eight yeah. auditions. And, and some actors on our show too, yeah. same thing. Well, so, so tell us about your audition process. Uh, mine was, uh, I was telling uh, Jeff. Jeff <laughs> that, uh, Shade. <laughs> I, I, we're so close. Uh, I was telling Jeff that the, uh, and Nana, uh, that um, my process was different because I had called my agents when I heard that they were doing Star Trek, uh, Next Generation, I said, hey, I really want to do this show, can you call? So they called in and they said, oh, we're really sorry, it's already been cast. Got everybody, but if, if something comes up, we'll, we'll call you. And that was it, it was done. I didn't think any more about it. And then two weeks later, we get a call and they say, they're thinking of putting a Klingon on the bridge, they want you to read for it. And that was, and Unlike the other cast members, I was in there, they looked at probably, I want to say 16 other actors in, in this one day they had come in. It may be more, maybe less, but it, I think it was around 16. The next day and a half, so that was on a Wednesday, on Friday, they had it down to three. So it was only three of us. And one was a guy named James Watkins, and the other was James Avery who was the Fresh yeah, Prince of Beverly Heroes, yeah. Uncle Phil. Uncle Phil. Yeah. Uncle Phil. And it was three of us. And we went in and read twice. And they said, okay, thank you, everybody. This is my naivety, you know me. They said, okay, thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll let you know. So we were leaving, and they said, hey, Michael, could you wait a minute? We, uh, we have a video that you sent in that we want to give back to you. Could you wait till we get it? And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> And Corey Allen, who's the director, comes out and says, it's gonna be nice working with you, Mike. 
And, um, and, and I hugged him like he was my father. I went, oh my God, because for all of us, and we, I think we've all, born, when you get a pilot, it's really kind of the culmination of a lot of work. And even if it just is the pilot, it still is that, that thing. Anyway, but that's how I got it. And it was different because that day, they sent me, I mean, that day that, I, that they told me, they sent me into makeup. They did the makeup test. They did all the filming. And then the following week, I was, I was filming. So it was, and the, the other actors didn't know who I was for like weeks. Who's this guy? I, I just showed up and started acting, started doing stuff. Who's so. this? Who's this? Who so is it was this? wild. It was wild. What about you, Jeffrey? Mine's totally different. <laughs> totally different. I have a memory of auditioning a couple of times after Deep Space Nine was running and not getting. Maybe on one I got close, but not getting. And one time I got a guest star. So I go in, I think it was in the third season, and there's Jonathan Frakes. Now I had been, I, I knew Jonathan sort of because at one point some years earlier, he and I had been paired up to do a improvisation of two guys trying to steal a car for the director John Schlesinger, who directed Midnight Cowboy. And so because of that, I knew Jonathan. We had, had an audition together, which is kind of kind of rare for actors. You usually go in by yourself and you walk out by yourself. And so here's Jonathan. He's on Next Gen, but he's he's stepping into directing now. And so he's directing this episode. So that was a nice hi. How are you? So I do my thing, and I, and um, I was not Brunt. And it was not Wayun. It was a, a one a character named Tehran. Doesn't matter. Wanted a hologram of you from Quark. Wanted a, wanted a hologram of you. That makes sense. It really does. And so uh, uh, Quark, of co course, couldn't get it. He, so he was panicked because I paid him and he wasn't delivering. You know. So anyway. I start to leave the audition and Jonathan says to me, hey Jeff, I turn around and he goes, you know that thing, that, that thing that we auditioned for together? Did you get that? I went, yeah, I did, Jonathan. I, I, uh, it was a different role, but yeah, I, I got a little thing in that movie. And he went, hey, Jonathan, you. I think you're doing okay. All right, I, I think you're fine. And uh, I, I got the part, and because of that, I was telling Kennedy, Michael. <laughs> got him. <laughs> Booyah! Got him! <laughs> Just before he came out, I was telling Michael, because of that, I'm on set doing that, and Rene Aubergeois, a dear friend that I'd done theater with, was prepping to direct a Ferengi episode. And he suggested to the producers me to play this new character, Brunt. Okay. And that's how I got Brunt. And because I got Brunt, that's how I got Wayun. I had said kind of an unbelievable turn of events, but it, your, your career can turn on the, the smallest little twists kind of frightening to think about when you... Okay, thank you very much for answering the question. That's a long answer. Kennedy, Sorry about I'm that. I'm very proud of you. Aren't you proud of her, guys? Yes. And, and here's Thanks, Morgan. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I remember you. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. It's good to see you all again. So we, of course, are all here because we are constantly inspired by Star Trek and the franchise and what it upholds. And I'm very much looking forward to being re-inspired by Deep Space Nine with the documentary coming out next month. Um, did you not know that? <laughs> the documentary, you can't hear me? Is this better? Yeah, we hear you, That's yeah. Good. The documentary yeah. comes out in theaters for one day next month, and I'm stoked. That's good. 
But in the meantime, we are all inspired by the franchise on constantly. So I'm curious, what lately has been inspiring you guys, just in life in general? Something you've read or seen or done that's really stuck with you and inspired you lately? Michael, we were just talking about this uh, earlier in the green room. So that's, that's an excellent question. What's inspiring you guys these days? These days, um, you, you mean in the business necessarily or just in, in any life or, in general? Or in talking? general, yeah. Um, I, you know, it, that's, that's, that's a difficult question. Uh, a lot of things inspire me. You know, it's like getting up in the morning inspires me, you know, and, and, and being, you know, around my friends inspire me. Um, she's inspiration to me. <laughs> Uh, Nana. Doing Aikido in Japan. Doing <laughs> Aikido in Japan. That was inspirational, too. So, so there's a lot of things. It's not anything in particular. I mean, I, I love documentaries, and so I see a lot of documentaries, and they inspire me. I saw the re a recent one that's one of several about Jackie Robinson that was inspirational, that was insane, you know? But, uh, but a lot of things inspire me. Christopher Hitchens, I don't know if you... He inspires me. Okay. How about you, Nina? What's inspiring you these days? Right now, I'm uh, taking a, a course on um, the neuroscience behind and the practical application of mindfulness. Uh, and, and that is, we, we, we've learned so much about the brain just in the last few years and uh, why meditation works and how our brains and bodies uh, it, how, how, how it really functions. It's all new information and I'm finding that and the application to not only my own life but to acting fascinating. Um, that's, that's right now a huge inspiration to me. How about you? That sounds awesome. Uh, I love to read so books inspire me. Uh, I I my secret little hobby is playing the guitar. I'm a bit of a reclusive guitar player. I do not know how to play very many songs that that I, I'm sure I could learn them. I love I'm, the songs you I'm do not, with the Rat Pack. Uh, Those uh, are yeah, amazing. thank you, the Those Rat Pack. But so so, but I, you know, it's sort of my. I remember hearing a lyric of James Taylor many years ago where he said, you know, if basically if you're an artist, keep something for yourself. Keep something for yourself. And so for me, playing the guitar just for myself is my way of holding on to something. Wow, that's impressive. That's, that's nice. And my children inspire me. Oh, there okay? you go. Awesome. I just heard a song that he wrote, and it's, he's so good. I had no idea. I've heard of him in the Rat Pack, too, but he's so good on the guitar. It's incredible. Song's awesome. great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll hear of an album or something that oh, you, you put I, out. I, I, yeah, I'm not really... The works of Jeffrey Coombs. I'm not really know. thinking about that. Thanks. <laughs> A.K.A. Way Tunes. <laughs> way Tunes. Way for it. Way for it. Way for it. TM, TM. Mic drop. <laughs> Way Tunes does brunt force music. Yes. Brunt force it's just, it's, music. It's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to scoot. I got to oh, fight no. to catch. But before I do. Uh, what, do you got to move your car or something? What do you got to do? No, I need to go back to sunshine and, and warm weather and my pool. Um, but Kennedy is going to take over the, uh, the second half of this. But before we go, I have to give Michael something real quick that I've been holding on in my house for a year. Okay? This is Marina Sirtis' scarf. It's been in my house for a year. Will you give it to her, please? Thank you very much. Okay. Is that your underwear? What is that? Always bragging, aren't you, Mark? Always. Yeah, I, I have what been that? in my house for a year. She <laughs> left it there. <laughs> I have Terry Farrell's scarf and glasses in my car, and I keep re I'm trying to give them to her. 
I always forget. Yep. I'll, I'll give it to her. Guys, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and continue with our Deep Space Nine panel. We'll see you guys next time. I'll see Be you safe. Later. Thank you. Uh, safe you got journey. this, baby. You're a pro. Uh, ladies You're and gentlemen, pro. Mark B. Lee. All right, folks, I see a line accumulating, and I, I see you, and I want to hear what you got to say, but I have a burning question for these three folks up here. I, I tried to find uh, a good example of an episode where the three of you would be on it in some capacity, and my favorite episode by far is Far Beyond the Stars, all right? For those of you who are not aware of Far Beyond the Stars, it's in the sixth, ep sixth season, 13th episode, uh, Benjamin Sisko has these weird visions where he's a science fiction writer in the 1950s who has visions of a black uh, space station captain and tries to get the story published, can't get the story published because racism, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. What I love most about this episode was not only the fact that it was directed by the one and only Avery Brooks, captain my captain. Y'all ain't gonna applaud for the captain? Come on now, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Because last time I checked, Thank you very much. What I love most about this, this episode in particular is it is a stunning example of the range that you all have, right? We are so accustomed to seeing these folks in, in certain characters, but, and, and maybe in your case, Jeffrey, we see you as a million and three things all the time, but we were so used to seeing Kira as Kira and, and Worf as Worf. To see you all get a chance to flex those chops a little bit was immensely satisfying for me and I'm sure many others here today. Can you talk about, oh yeah, see, yay. Can we talk about that experience real fast? I see you, I love you, I'm gonna get right back to you, okay? Michael, let's start with you. Willie Mays, of all people, holy cats. Um, I just loved it that I didn't have to put on makeup. That was, you know, people were looking at me like, why are you smiling so much? I'm not, I, I don't have to put on makeup. You were ear to ear that episode. I you was. were all teeth that episode. He was oh, just God. happy not to be in that in that mask. It was it was it, it it was wonderful not to be in makeup and to and to play just a character that isn't an alien or whatever the case. So I, I had a good time with that. But I gotta say that I, I I absolutely saw how and you forget because everybody's in makeup and you're doing a role, but you you saw why these people were, were working actors. You saw everybody. Uh, Renee was fabulous. Armin's fabulous. Nana was fabulous. Column. I mean, everybody was just really good not being aliens, you know? And you go, you know, you just forget. I mean, I, I get naive sometimes, but I go, ah, uh, that's why they're, you know, they're they got the job, is that they're really good, you know? I mean, you, you just forget. And I was just, I'm always looking at other actors, you know, and I lose myself in that because I'm admiring what they're doing. And they were really good in that episode. Yeah, there was some really meaty performances in that one. Um, Nana, talk about your experience as a science fiction author who couldn't get done because she was a woman. A woman. Uh, right. I, you know... Actually, it, all this stuff of wish Deep Space Nine had had a movie, blah, 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 never going to happen, blah, blah, blah. If that could have been our film, that episode, um, it was on so many levels. The writing, the, the Avery did an amazing job of directing, the meaning of it, uh, the looking at racism and science fiction and women and all of it. It, it just had so much going on in it and the the uh, having to refocus and think wait a minute we're on a space station wait a minute we're in someone's mind wait what's happening where where is the reality here i it was just fascinating subject matter and i think that should have could have should have could have been our film it occurs to me that um as actors most of our careers, we're not in makeup like that. We're not in alien makeup. And when we were blessed to be on Star Trek, it was a it was, it was great joy. But I think everybody would everybody would agree that there was also a certain amount of. Um,
frustration <laughs> that, uh, that people viewed us as, oh, you're just kind of makeup actors. I mean, really, there was sort of this prejudice. In the business, there is. Once you are successful in a particular genre, you do your job so well that, it's, that it sticks with people, you are stuck in a way. Oh, that's what you do, and if we need that, that's where we'll go. But otherwise, I don't really think of you as, uh, you know, a woman from the 50s or, uh, you, you know, a guy from New York or, uh, or a, uh, a brutal New York cop. You, you're just not that, right? So it's not true, and it's a battle that all actors have to fight that you don't get um, just pigeonholed. It's, it's a futile battle. It's a quixotic battle, but it's, it's, it's a noble battle that we all have to do. So for me, that episode is absolute... Uh, validation that uh, with or without the makeup, uh, uh, you know, actors do their job. And don't, don't categorize this, please. Thank you. I mean, that was proof in the pudding. Let's get back to some of these questions. Hi, you've been so patient. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great. Be sure to talk to that microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Uh, a little nervous. So, uh, don't be nervous. Get a little closer there. I'm a, I'm a sci-fi guy. Love sci-fi. Um, well, I have to say that my wife and my youngest son are probably the biggest, you know, Star Trek, you know, just, uh, I don't want to say groupies, but, you know, just Trekkers. Trekkers. And uh, my youngest didn't grow up on cartoons. Like, he watched cartoons. He grew up on Star Trek, you know, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, you know, uh, and he's just watched everything probably dozens of times. Um, so I asked him because uh, he wanted to ask you one question. He says, uh, now he's 15 years old, uh, he says, this is for Worf, how miserable in detail was putting all that makeup on? How miserable in detail. How miserable was putting on the makeup. <laughs> like you really want to go through that. Poor thing, we just yeah. got you out of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> now it was, um, it, was, it was pretty brutal. Um, you don't really think about it that much while you're doing it, you know, you get a job and it's, and it's, you, you don't think about the future that much about, oh, I'm going to be doing this for two or three years or something. You're just happy to get the job, happy to be working. And, um, but it was at a time when the makeup hadn't changed in 70 years. Uh, they hadn't come up with anything new. Uh, it was still being applied like the original Frankenstein, you know, with spirit gum and, and this adhesive, surgical adhesive, and it's ether-based, and uh, it, it, was, it was really hard. I mean, in terms of, it started to burn my skin. Oh, no. Yep. It started to, um, Welcome to my world. <laughs> and um, and it, be, it was, um, for two years, it was, it was incredibly hard. And the, the second season, <clears throat> I talked to the producers, and they were able to change a lot of things and finally get it to a manageable. And then when I went to Deep Space, one of my concerns was, well, there's a couple of concerns, was what kind of part was it going to be? And also... Are they going to, I, I wanted them to not just have me in makeup to stand around. You know, like, if you needed me for something, if it was gonna be a part, and blah, 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 then put me in, but just don't like, oh, well, we need Worf in there, so let's put him in makeup for 12 hours and not say anything, you know, mm. uh, for two or three days in a row. And they were very good about that, but it was, it was pretty brutal, it was pretty brutal. Um, in fact, same thing we're talking about uh, Far Beyond the Stars is that after the show was over and I started doing other things, people in the makeup trailer would be going, once again, why are you so happy? Because it'd be 20 minutes and I'm done. I mean, they'd go, uh, thank you. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I said, you don't understand. But I got to say a funny story. This, 
Funny Star Trek story. Um, I think it was the fifth or sixth, or maybe even the seventh season of Next Generation. Uh, I was doing, um, I had a, a, a recurring role on this sitcom with, um, oh God, Telma Hopkins and Cindy Williams called Out All Night or something like that. I forgot the name of it. Anyway, and this one scene is where I go into the kitchen, I knock on the door, and they open the door and they say, oh, hello, come on in. And I come on in and I go and I start the scene. So the first time I do it, I say, oh, hi. They open the door and I come in and the guy says, the director says, uh, Michael, excuse me, uh, could you close the door? And I go, sure. So I close the door. Second day, I come in, do the scene three, four times, don't close the door. I walk in, they go, Michael, could you please close the door? And I go, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So I turn around and close the door. So, and this is, I think, you know, in sitcoms, they get to the, the taping or the, the run-through, the final run-through, and I come in, don't close the door. And the director jumps up and down and he's screaming at me, close the effing door! <laughs> and it just hit me, I said, you don't understand. I haven't closed a door in seven years. <laughs> Close the door? I don't understand. What I'm, type of 20th and I go, Oh my God. In know? the future, doors close themselves. Well, that's the thing is that I'm going through the, we've been through, I don't know, a thousand doors and they always close by themselves. <laughs> I know, and I walk in and he was like, he was literally, he was a guy about this tall, and he was jumping up and down, just yelling at me. I'm like, oh, anyway. Wow. Hi, thanks for your patience. Yeah, this is actually a question for uh, Nana. I mean... Say it in the microphone, Hans, uh, so yeah, we can this, hear you. Yeah, this is a question for Nana. Like, how did it feel during that season where um, you were pregnant? Uh, how did it feel when they decided to use it as a plot point rather than hide it? Uh, the fact that they used it as a plot point... Uh, it was brilliant. Brilliant, and it. Someone was just. Uh, there was an actress who uh, was. Yeah, she was just let go from a show for being pregnant. I can't remember her name. I can see her, but I can't think of her name. But I was. I was worried I was going to lose my job over the fact that uh, I was having a baby. And not only did they not make me hide behind things, you know, for 10 months, but they, they made it a part, it was so freeing and easy and, oh. I have a question for yeah. you. Go ahead. Was it after this lady had her thing that they, okay. So they, yeah, it was. Yeah, because I was aware of it. And they are aware of it too, probably. Yes, think? Oh, they yeah, were. Good. And I think Ira Stephen Bear's wife is the one who came up with the idea that there was uh, a, that that they should just make me pregnant, but make it a shuttlecraft accident. Um, that <laughs> that they had to uh, take the baby from Keiko and um, put it in me so that I'd carry it to term. And it was br it was a brilliant idea, and I was so grateful, really grateful. And, and managed to slay in maternity uniforms. Can we give a holler at the costume design for that? I was like, okay, oh, yeah. Kira, can you not be fabulous for like two seconds? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. Hi. My name is James. And I want to dovetail off of uh, your remark about uh, Far Beyond the Stars. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the three of you, um, you know, what is your personal favorite episode? And could you tell me some of the behind the scenes details about it? I'm, I'm very fascinated about uh, you know, the behind the scenes stories. Sure, aren't we all? Jeffrey, let's start with you. Faith, treachery, and the great river. Um, a defective Wayun who defects, um, and mainly because there were only a handful of, of um, recurring roles that the, that, that the writers, particularly Iris Stephen Bear, just gave the series regulars 
a week off and and or you had a day and turn the focus to sort of examine Garrick or to examine Gul Dukat or in my case, Wei Yun. It's, uh, the, the thing that meant so much to me about it was I did get to explore the, the character in a, as, as if he were a, a good and decent person instead of a, a conniving, smiling backstabber. <laughs> but I also got to work on a multi-day in a shuttle with my dear friend Rene Bergemois. And I had done theater with Rene some years early. I deeply respect and admire him. And I was just um, really a culmination for me to be able to, to, to work with him so closely for such an intense period of time. So that's my answer. Excellent. No, no, your turn. Uh, oh, wait, I have the same answer always. It was duet. I thought it was such a, a well-written show. Uh, it, it was meant to save money because they'd spent so much on the uh, pilot and special effects. They wanted to do one that had no special effects and as few actors as possible. And uh, the fact that it came out, and I thought it was a disaster uh, while we were doing it. it. It didn't film easily at all. No, it didn't. Um, uh, Harris Yulin was not used to the makeup. It, and if you're not used to that kind of makeup, it can throw you badly. And he had a hard time remembering his lines. And I thought, oh my God, this is, it's not going to cut together. And my God, his performance is so heart-wrenching as is yours uh, thank yes. you so much i loved it um and i just so it made me think about who uh, what i was playing and what was going on in her mind and how she was a racist and she was just realizing how much of a racist she was um that it, it, it made me really think through the moments of, of, of being that person. And I'm always grateful for it. I, I felt like it, that's, that's a well-examined uh, thing in my life because of her and it. Mm -hmm. It's the gem of the first season, I think. What's that? That episode is the gem of the first season. Uh, when I, uh, on Next Generation, there were two episodes. Um, uh, the Offspring, where Data builds a child, and um, The Drumhead, which is like a courtroom drama. Uh, I didn't have much to do with, with either of them. The, the, the Drumhead, a little bit more. But uh, I thought that they were amazing stories, and very heartfelt and dramatic, uh, wonderful actors, and just so happened, uh, I'm not prejudiced, but uh, Jonathan Frakes directed both of those. Uh, and then on Deep Space, there were two. There was Soldiers of the Empire and Once More to the Breach. And I thought that they were... And, and, and Ron Moore wrote both of those. Mm. And it was, it was like the quintessential Klingon episodes, you know? And, uh, and I thought that they were, they were fantastic. Yes, yes, yeah. wonderful. Thanks. If I, if I didn't say it back there... Uh, Deep Space Nine is my favorite show of any show hey. ever. Hey, I think we can agree. <laughs> and Thank you so much. You'll Thank be you. looking forward to the documentary then, no doubt, huh? Uh, yes, yes, very much so. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Oh, okay, I know you're used to people like nerding out and geeking out before you. But has, I know you're used to geeking out and nerding out, you're having someone do that before you. But has there been anyone for each of you that you've met that you just pretty much felt like, oh my goodness, they can see straight through, through me that I am just so stoked to meet these people, you know? Like, like a hero or somebody you got to meet or work with that was just amazing for you. So your question is, who, have they met anybody who the, they, they have never met over the course of their career that, they that were just, helped influence them in some way? No, someone they never expected to get a chance to be around that sort of made them 
feel more like a child again, just being around them. Oh, a fanboy moment. Yeah, give me a fanboy moment. Gotcha. <laughs> I'll get them. Makes sense. Uh, I, d I just had my first fanboy moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, or with, how could um, you? Oh, you're not talking. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's a different moment. Uh, this, um, I, I, I love Law and Order, the, the original. Uh -huh. And I'm always really cool. I'm always really, you know, I see people that I, I work with, um, uh, Dennis. Yes, I worked with Dennis Hopper, and that was really fantastic. Uh, a couple other people, but I saw Sam Waterston oh, in the airport, oh, yeah. and <laughs> I was getting my my bags, and I went, ah, uh, ah, uh, and I had to go up to him, and I never do that. And I went up to him, and I said, "Excuse me, you should have won an Emmy for every year that you were on that show," and he goes. I was very disappointed. <laughs> and I went, thank you. Walked away. <laughs> that was my, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to mix up the sequence a little bit. I'll come back to you, Nana. Jeffrey, how about, how about your fan moment? Well, the one that jumped into my head was actually had to do with Star Trek and that I was walking across the Paramount lot on my way mm -hmm. yeah. and coming towards me. And, you know, when you see these people it's it's a surreal kind of mm -hmm. lapsing clicking realization that's fucking Jack Lemon oh. oh that's Jack Lemon <laughs> and he's walking right towards me uh, 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 and he gets closer and closer and then it ran through my mind should I say something no, I'm a coward. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> he would probably be disturbed if I bothered him. And he passed me, and a little voice in my sa inside me said, say something. <laughs> so I turned around and I said, Mr. Lemon. And he turned around and looked at me, and I said, uh, uh, just thank you for uh, everything. <laughs> And then he did the, the finest Jack Lemmon impersonation I've ever seen. <laughs> he said, oh, uh, 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 thank you. And he kept going. John effing Lemon. Jack Lemon. That's what I said. Oh, yeah. these, these things are not very good. <laughs> no, no. Um, this is a strange one, but... Um, I was in New York and I'd really kind of, for whatever reason, lost my creative juice. I, nothing had excited me that I'd seen. I'd been to a lot of theater and I was just like, and I went to the public theater and saw a performance artist named Puddle's Pity Party. Mm -hmm. and, and if you ever get a chance to see him in person, it's just a whole different thing. Um, and and I see him every chance I get now, and it's he's having to adjust his show to fit a wider public. But at that time, it was it was the lifeblood I needed to go. That's it. That's creativity. That's brilliant performance art. And it woke me up during his performance and his voice. Uh, and uh, he had he would take pictures afterwards with people, yeah. you know, like we do. Yeah. I lost my mind. <laughs> I lost my mind, and my husband was so embarrassed because I pushed in front of everybody else <laughs> to get my. And I have this picture with Puddle's pity party, and there's this stupid <laughs> grin I have on my face, and I'm <laughs> hanging on to him. And the best part was I found out that he loves Deep Space Nine. So that that totally worked out. He made his day too. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Uh, th thanks. Was... Thank you. Next. Hi, Kennedy. Uh, hey guys. Uh, over that seven years, you've had so many different directors. Uh, one of my favorite episodes was directed by Anton Williams. 
Do you guys have a favorite director, and what about them makes them your favorite? Feel free. Favorite director on Deep Space Nine? Yes. Yeah. I, I'd say I have, I have two. Avery Brooks. That's what I was going to say. Um, Avery. This gentleman right here. <laughs> And, and I should mention also, actually, David Carson, who directed the pilot, and who was so, he held the wolves at bay while he gave us the chance to figure out our stuff and who we were. We were just, you know, it, it was all new. And of course, they wanted us to go quick. And he was like, nope. He was very, he's this very, very um, demure Englishman but when it came to keeping producers out of the room, he was like, he was such a hero. Um, and I'd say, so that's three that I have. Avery, and, and, and I'm surprised that I would say that. The, the weird thing is the first 12 episodes of Deep Space Nine that I did were all directed by actors. That I think that's a record. Any, no, I don't think anybody else can say that. But I kept coming back, and it would be, you know, and I'm glad for it, but it was, it was Jonathan, or it was Renee, or it was LaVar, or I, it just was like, where are the, like, yeah, LaVar directed a lot of episodes. But Avery was in a special sort of class all, 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 in, all his own. He was like a different person when he was a director than when you worked with him as an actor. He was a little, um, kind of kept you off balance a little bit when you worked with him in a scene. I, I never quite knew if he was going to attack or not, which is good. Kept me guessing. But, but, but as a director, he seemed much happier and more open and very creative and intuitive and minimalist, actually. Oh my God, it was so fun. When he would direct, he'd, you'd do the scene and he'd come up and he'd go, like that. <laughs> and that was your direction. And you'd go, got it. Got it. <laughs> got it. He did the same with me. I did this long thing. I was a doing Brunt, and, he, and, I, and, I, and I did put it all together, and, and he came up to me, and we go, we're going to do it one more time, and he looked at me, and he said, slalom, <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> and I went, slalom? Oh, oh yeah, you mean, oh yeah, got it. I understand what he means. Put it together, fly, be, be bold, hit the flags, keep on your course, put it together. Yes, beautiful. Actors understand minimalist, we don't need a paragraph. A word will do and we're reset. Yeah. And he knew that. Michael, what about you? What's uh, one of your favorite directors? Uh, it's got to be uh, Jonathan. Um, he was... Um, uh, Frakes was... was uh, really, really good at actors because he loves actors. And he knows how to direct, and he knows drama, and he knows when to talk and when not to talk. And um, uh, I, I mean, the most, we had a lot of fun on Next Generation, but when we did uh, First Contact, the movie, which he directed, it was a joy. I mean, he actually, they, I think they let him alone a lot uh, on, that, on that show. So he, they let us alone. And it really was, was, was wonderful. He's, he still is a, just a fabulous director. But uh, he's my favorite. He's my favorite. I mean, he and I, are, we, we're, we're the biggest actors, pound for pound, we're the biggest actors on Star Trek. And... Um, <laughs> So, you know, we get it. You know, we get it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. All right. I love your shirt. Thanks. Hi, guys. Hey. 
Um, two quick questions. One, did, did any of you get to take anything home with you? Like, uh, oh, vo- get out of my bag, yo. I was about to ask them that. <laughs> Vorta ears or, or earrings or cranial ridges uh, or, or anything. And number two, uh, do we, have any of you been approached? Can we possibly expect to see any of you uh, on the Orville? The what? The what? If you don't know the Orville, you can go. I beg your pardon, sir. You can have a seat for all that. Thanks. Yeah, I actually got a role on the Orville, and I, was ha- I couldn't do it. I was halfway, I, I was in the process of moving with my two elderly lady dogs and a parrot in a car across country uh, with my husband, and I was, I was, I think, in Pennsylvania, and they said, come do the Orville in, in a couple of days. And I went, I, I can't, I can't do it. I can't leave. So uh, I missed out on that. But hopefully I'll get hired for something else. Did you keep your earring? I did keep my earring. Um, I took another thing from the promenade. There, it was a sign. It was a bony fish. But you know what? It got, it got, I moved so many times. I moved to New Mexico to do a series in Las Vegas, always for work. But I moved so many times, the box it, it was in was lost. So someone's got a bony fish and they have no idea what the heck that was for. But yeah, it's gone now. Uh, I got nothing from Deep Space Nine. But at the end of Enterprise. Woo. Yeah. I, was, um, I didn't want to cross streams, but holy cats, Commander Shron. Mm. Shut up, pink skin. It's like, wait a minute now. Um, Not many people know this, but I have known the costume designer of Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise, and the movies, Mr. Bob Blackman, since I was 18 years old. And the last day of shooting of Enterprise, uh, there was a knock on my trailer, and I opened it up, and Bob Blackman handed me Shran's boots said, don't tell anybody, and left. So you, we, you all didn't hear that from Jeffrey, okay? If it comes back later? So that's the only thing I have, is Shran's, Shran's boots. boots. Excellent. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't take anything um, from either. I mean, there was a, the no, last... Said, what? No, the last, the last headpiece that I had, um, they kind of said, hey, would you like this? And I went, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but... And I told this story before, and I never told it before, before the, we were in Vegas, but the last day or towards the last episode of Next Generation, I get a call from Studio Services, and they kind of take care of all the minutia around the studio, just, you know, they give you, you know, maps or whatever the case. And they called and they said, uh, Mr. Dorn, we'd like you to turn in your parking card your parking card. There's a card that the actors got so that when they come in, they wave it in front of the gate and it lets you in. You go to your parking space or you go to where you park. And they called and they said, we want you to turn it in. Did, it, did anybody else have to give up their parking card? I, I don't know. I don't know. But something happened and I got pissed off because I'm saying... Wait a minute. Um, you want me to turn in my car- parking card? Like all of a sudden, I'm going to leave the show, and then I'm going to come back and go through everybody's office and steal things because I have. What a do you think card. I'm going to do with my parking? Yeah, with card. my parking card, or just come in, come in, and just hang around. So my question, my follow-up question is then, what did you do when you got your parking card for Deep Space Nine? Well, they'd never got the parking card from Next Generation. <laughs> my man! He said, no, this is mine. Thank I you did. very I, much. I did. I told him, I said, no. And they go, what do, you mean? <laughs> what do you mean, no? I said, no, I'm not turning it in. And I still have that parking card. <laughs> Hell home. yeah. Hell yeah. A parking card two series, a handful of movies, an online petition for a Captain Wharf series, and a freaking parking card. 
and a parking card. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least. Hello, everyone. I've been a, a fan of you guys for since I was that tall. So I just want to say first. Talk to that mic so we can hear you. First, I want to say thank you so much for the work. Thank you. When you're, for all three of you, when you think about your character's arc through the miniseries or for D Space Nine, the like, cultural character, the social, political, the religious significance, what was the most rewarding takeaway that you have from your character's arc? Yeah, good in the question. Series? What was the most rewarding takeaway from your character's contribution to Trek overall or in to Deep Trek. Space Nine? To Trek. To, to the Trek verse. I think, hopefully, you know, for me, if somebody gets out of it, that's great. But uh, hopefully, that um, Worf is was always searching for answers. Always, you know, who am I? What does this all mean? You know, is there a Stovall core? Is you know, uh, what's a warrior? What's the worth of a true warrior? What is a war you know? all of those questions and he was always asking questions and i think that that's really good for for all of us is always asking questions but also being open to answers or uh not even answers but other ways of thinking and he's always looking for that and i thought that that was great uh, Certainly for me, my, my, when I talk to women uh, who grew up watching Kira, it was important to them that it was okay to be angry, it was okay to have appetites, it was okay to be wrong and to find a way back um, and, and make yourself bigger. And that's what I loved. It wasn't always fun playing her. It wasn't um, rewarding at the time. I got a lot of pushback from a lot of people about, about her, just the way I was playing her. Why can't you be nice? Right. Why can't you smile more? Right. Yeah. Like pushback from who? From, uh, from people who, from, from people who watched the show, who were involved in the show, um, who were involved in the world. So, yeah, uh, and, but, I'm, but now I never regret it when a woman comes up to me and said, it helped. I was so angry as a young girl and I saw this and it, it helped me see that oh, there's a way through the anger. It was like, oh, it's, that makes it 10 times worth it, totally. I suppose for me it's the accident of it happening that, that, that I was never meant to be a recurring character. I wasn't planned. Wei Yun was not planned to be a recurring character. He actually was killed at the end of the episode. It was not thought of that way and just because of luck and maybe what I brought to it. The writer said, why did we kill him? Let's bring him back. Let's clone him. This, this is a miracle for a, an actor. I walked away from shooting that episode and thinking, well, that was nice. That's it. On to the next thing, whatever it will be. And, and so just the miracle that a seed got watered and, and blossomed, and I was fortunate to keep coming back. I, like, I wasn't in the pilot. I wasn't, wasn't even thought of in that way. So that sort of good fortune is what I'm most amazed at. What a pleasant surprise, right? Thank you. A very pleasant surprise. Thank you so much. Wow, this is incredible, guys. I, I think we have a couple more seconds to spare. So oh, one more question? Come on in, real quick, real quick. Come on up here with your TARDIS, I see you. <laughs> this question is from Michael. Do you still fly airplanes? Ooh, do you still fly, fly airplanes? airplanes? Yeah, what you got? What you got under your hood? What is it? Tell me, you got your stealth bomber yet? No, um, I, I, I had a Citation uh, jet 
that I flew uh, up until a year ago and I sold it. And now I'm looking for one of two airplanes. Uh, one is a, a Learjet, and if not that, then a F-5 Freedom Fighter. It's a um, single seat fighter jet. Um, F-5, if you want to look it up, F-5 Freedom Fighter, or a Lear 35, one of those. And that's, those are my, my next. Or if you have one you want to sell him. You know, just, <laughs> just hanging around, just chilling in the back of the yeah, house. Yeah, you know, you... Mine I'm not ready to sell to him fair. yet. Not yet. Fair, oh, fair, yeah. fair, fair. Somebody asked me, <laughs> I, I play tennis with these people, and, and they were like, so you, you fly a jet? I said, yeah. And they go, you mean you fly your own private jet? And I go, yeah. I said, doesn't everybody? Why not? Why not? Well, uh, Jeffrey, Nana, Michael, thank you so much. This has been an amazing time, a great thank conversation. Give it up. For those of Deep Space thank Nine. You. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. You can subscribe here to so subscribe to the channel. There's more videos off to the left. And Mr. J says, don't forget to ring that bell button for more notifications.